in 2001, I had a friend and she was 33 years old and doctors diagnosed her with breast cancer. And they said they had done all they could do and they could do no more. And I went into the Bible bookstore one day. My heart was heavy and that song was playing. So every morning as I got up and would ride to work, I would listen to that song about still away, still away home to Jesus. Because, see, the doctors had told her she didn't have long to stay here. But the thing that disturbed me the most is that she had not accepted Jesus Christ as her Lord and Savior. And every time I would present that option to her, she was so angry and she would say, but why did he do this to me? I got a six-year-old child and a seven-year-old child and a 17-year-old boy that I need to be here for. And she was so angry at God because her mother had passed away at 33 years old from breast cancer. And I remember going to her funeral as I thought it would be a funeral because she had not accepted the Lord. And I sat there with my eyes down and my heart so heavy. But there's always a ram in the bush. And this young minister, he stood up as he gave his words and he said that she had accepted Jesus Christ as her Lord and Savior two days before God had called her home. And I rejoiced that day and I still rejoice. And this is October and October is Breast Cancer Month. And I just want the women in here remember to go and get your mammograms. And men, breast cancer does not discriminate. You ought to be checking too. And I just say that today, and I thank God, and I want y'all to keep that family in prayer because her daughter, that six-year-old child, she grew up, and she's 22 years old, and doctors have already removed both of her breasts. So I ask y'all to keep the Sanders family in your prayers. I am so elated, I am so glad, and I am so happy to be a part of Gospel Truth Tabernacle of God Ministry. This is a unique and special place you are sitting in. I say thank you, Pastor Kirkwood, in your absence. Bless you, Pastor Shell, for always being there. Minister Ida, Minister Gwen, and Pastor Barbara McLeod. This is a good day. Oh, yes, it is. This is a good day. And there is a word from the Lord. Oh, yes, it is. Just for a little while, I'm going to talk to you about victory in spite of. Now, you had to fill in your blank, whatever it is, but remember, victory in spite of. Philippians 4 and 13. Philippians 4 and 13 is a scripture that many of us know very well. And if you would put that up on the screen, it says, I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. Oh, think about that. It says, I can do all things through Jesus Christ. Jesus is where our strength comes from. And without Jesus, I will tell you, you can do no good thing. Born again believers should not look at their trials and tribulations when they go through. But they should always look to God, who is the author and finisher of our salvation. Our victory is not in us, but our victory is in Christ Jesus. Ephesians 6 and 10. Ephesians 6 and 10 says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. The word finally, it denotes that after you done done all you can do to fix it, after you done exhausted all your human measures, finally, he says, bring it to me. Leave it here at the altar. I can take care of it. If you would just give it to me, you didn't even have to waste all that time worrying and trying to fix it for yourself. Finally, the apostle Paul is telling us, give it to God. We have to always understand that we don't have no power. The flesh is weak. It is very weak. But in Christ, you can do all things. And somebody may say, well, what do you mean by I can do all things in Christ? Well, what the scripture is really saying is he's giving you everything you need. He has already equipped you to finish your race. 
He's given it all to you. You have all the gifts, all the talents, everything you need to finish this race. Please remember that Jesus Christ has already won the battle. And that his victory is our victory. Stop trying to fight a battle that is not yours. Thank you, Lord. We were born with a sinful nature. That nature was passed down to us from Adam. Adam sinned by disobeying God. And because of what Adam done, we have a moral weakness inside of us. And that moral weakness, it continues to yield to the flesh. Oh, we try, oh, try it. Try to stand on your own power. Try to just go on a diet. I ain't going to eat no sweets today. Let somebody pass you with a donut. Because you're standing on your own moral power, and the flesh is weak. We can only keep our victory if our victory is in Christ Jesus. James 4 and 7. James 4 and 7 says, Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Now, many times we like to jump straight to resist the devil, and he will flee. But when you do that, you, you leave out the main part. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Because see, he's saying, you don't got no power to do this. Because you submitted yourself to God, then you can resist the devil and he will flee. But he coming back. Oh, he only going away for a season. He, he coming back. That's his nature. He always comes back. That's why while he's gone, you ought to be building yourself up in Christ. That's the only way you can keep your victory. It is so important for the word of God to be sown into our hearts. That's the only way we can be victorious in any situation. We must keep and protect the seed, which is the word of God, that is sown into our hearts. John 10 and 10. That scripture tells us that the enemy, who is the thief, the thief cometh but to do what? But to steal, kill, and destroy. That's his job. He's always on his job. The enemy seeks to steal from you. What is it that he wants to steal from me, Minister Wilson? He wants to steal the seed you have within you. And he wants to stop you from producing more seed. The word of God becomes Jesus in us. The heart of man is the target area to sow the seed. See, this is a heart thing. It has to be in the heart. Because, see, you can speak the word of God, but you don't have to believe it. But you can speak it. Jesus is the Logos, the living word. John 1 and 1 tells us, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Jesus was right there in the beginning. The Holy Spirit is a gentleman. He can only lead and guide you when you cooperate with him. The Holy Spirit's not going to fight you. You have to submit unto the Holy Spirit. He will not force you to do anything. The word submit means to give up your will. Give it up. Give up your way. And cooperate and do things his way. When you do things his way, then guess what? There's only one will. And that's his will. Lining your life up with his will. Amos 3 and 3 says, How can two walk together except they be agreed? You got to agree with the Holy Spirit for him to walk with you and for you to walk with him. To be in Christ. When we say we are in Christ, what we are really saying is that we are totally under the influence of his power. We are allowing the Holy Spirit to lead and guide our lives. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, my favorite scripture, trust in the Lord. With all your heart, and lean not to your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he shall direct your paths. Amen. Who is the him? Got to acknowledge God, and he will tell you which way to go. 
Psalms 119, 105, ladies of the life. That's our foundational scripture. It says, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Now, now back in biblical days, you got to remember, there was no street lights. You know, I don't know, in the city of Detroit, not too long ago, we didn't have working street lights. And when you walked out your house, it was really dark. You couldn't see your hand in front of your face. Now, back in biblical days, they walked down dirt roads, so they had a light on their sandals. And that light, see, the same dirt roads they walked down, the animals walked down those roads, too, and the animals left their dung in the road. So as they was walking down the road, they didn't want to step in the dung. Have you ever stepped in some dog mess with sandals on? So, so, so they could see the mess in the road, they had to have that light. You got to have that light in your life to see the mess in the road in your life. Because there's going to be some mess in the road. And if you don't have the word of God to light up the path, you're going to find yourself stepping in some mess. See, the word of God can shine light into any dark area in your life. The minute we accepted Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, we became an enemy to the devil. And it became his job to keep us defocused and distracted. Don't you understand that the devil is not mad at you? The devil is angry at God. And because we are not serving God, he will do whatever he can to get us off our mark. To show the world and to tell them about God's grace and mercy. That's what the devil is trying to stop us from doing. We must protect and keep the treasure that we already possess. What is that treasure, Minister Wilson? Well, in 2 Corinthians 4 and 7, says, there we go. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. That treasure is still talking about the word of God. 2 Corinthians 4 and 8 tells us that. So don't get so, always protect the word inside of you. The word, God's word will not come back void. It will help you no matter what. See, there's no peace in the world. The world is full of trouble. Oh, we call it peace because it's a temporary fix. You know, you go sit up on that bar stool and you drink a few shots, you throw them back, and it make you forget your problem for a little while. But when you wake up the next day, oh, my, you got that problem, and most times a hangover, too. See, we always got to know, in spite of what I'm going through, see, sometimes it can look like you're losing. It, it can look that way. It can look that way to everybody. Why you keep going to church? Why you keep talking about this? God, I see your situation. But see, they can't see the future. They don't see the future. They don't see your blessing is right around the corner because they can't see around that corner. They don't know about the power of God and the Holy Spirit. They don't understand when we tell them about Jesus who is sitting at the right hand of God the Father. And what is he doing at the right hand of God the Father? He's making intercessions for us. 1 Peter 1 and 23. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. How long does the word of God last? Forever. My God, my God. In order for the word of God to be sown into the heart of man, that heart must be prepared to receive it. Oh, there are a lot of people, they, they sitting up in church, they come to Bible study, they come to Christian education, they come to church every Sunday, but their heart has not received the word of God yet. How do you know? Because their life is a proof of it. How they live in shows you that they have not sown the word of God into their heart. Because the word of God will change your life. And as preachers, we must sow the word of God with clarity. We must make it simple. We must make it where even a baby can understand it. 2 Timothy 2 and 15 tells us, Study. To show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needed not be ashamed, one who knows how to rightly divide the word of truth. 
Well, how can you rightly divide the word of truth when you refuse to be taught? When you refuse to come and learn, when you refuse to study, I'm talking to preachers now. That's who I'm talking to. You know, we, we, we got to steal away. We got to find some time. You got to study this. The Holy Ghost said, I'll bring it back to your memory. But see, he can't bring something back to your memory that you ain't never know in the first place. You must have knowledge of the heart you are sowing into. See, if you can't feel the need of the people, and you cannot feel what they are going through, you will not be able to effectively help them. I've never been addicted to drugs, but I can feel the need of somebody who is struggling with a drug addiction. I, I had a conversation with someone not too long ago, and she was telling me, she said, well, I never used drugs, but I had an addiction to, to, to cigarettes and coffee, and so I know what they feel like. I said, well, well, answer me this. When was the last time you turned on the news and you saw a story about somebody breaking in somebody's house to get some money to buy cigarettes or to buy coffee? Uh, when was the last time a police officer walked around with a drug on them to stop somebody from smoking or stop somebody from drinking coffee? This got to be stronger than that. This addiction has to be stronger than that. It's not like a cigarette addiction or a coffee addiction. This has got to be stronger. How many times have you heard somebody say, I got mugged and they, they wanted to buy a pack of cigarettes? No. No. So I have to meet that person right there where they're at. The heart. God will give you that heart. You ain't never had to take the drug, but you have a heart for the person. You got to feel them. You can't come at them with that judgmental attitude. Oh, sister, oh, brother, lead them to God. Just keep pointing them to the cross. God can deliver you. God can get you out of any situation. Is there anything too hard for God? See, you can't give meat, which is solid food, to a baby. Okay, take a baby and put a steak, a well-done steak with all the trimmings, and put it in front of a six-month-old baby. Baby will starve to death with that steak right there because that baby cannot chew that steak. That baby cannot feed on that steak. Meat is not for a baby. You must give a baby milk. They can't do solid food, but they have to have milk. Now, you can give adults milk and meat, and, and you should. You should give them the milk of the word and the meat of the word. Adults are able to grow by the milk of the word and the meat of the word. First Peter 2 and 2 tells us, as newborn babies desire the sincere milk of the word that ye may grow thereby. Yes. Mature saints, wait on them, y'all. They coming. They, they on milk. Just wait on them. Remember when you was on milk? Not too long ago, I was on milk. Thank you, Jesus. 2 Timothy 3 and 16. 2 Timothy 3 and 16 tells us all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. All scripture, they said, being profitable for doctrine. Doctrine is teaching. For reproof is to give evidence or conviction of the truth. Hebrews 11 and 1. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. You have conviction in your faith. For correction means to bring things back to their proper place. It means to expose false doctrine and make corrections. And for instructions in right living. The Bible was written for who? Who was the Bible written for, the unsaved or the saved? For the saved. 
That's our instruction manual. So stop trying to force feed it to them. That's your instruction manual. And because you're not following the instruction manual the way it should be followed many times, they're not following you. Yes. Hallelujah. I keep saying stop showing people the false Jesus. They're looking at you, and you don't even know they're looking at you. People watch you. They see you getting up with your pretty clothes on every Sunday going to church, and they see what you do Sunday night too. They are watching you. Matthew 13 and 4. And when he sold, some seed fell by the wayside, and the fowls came and devoured it. Let's go to the next verse, the fifth verse. Some fell upon stony places where they had not much earth. And forthwith they sprung up because they had no deepness of earth. Oh, my God. The ones that fell by the wayside. You know, we talk about falling on good ground. The ones that fell into good ground are the ones that fell into the heart of man. The word that fell into the heart of man. And in that scripture, down by the eighth verse, you will find. Hmm. But others fell into good ground and bought forth what? What did it bring forth? Fruit. Ah. Some a hundredfold, some sixtyfold, and some thirtyfold. See, that's our job. We have to bring forth fruit. But how do you bring forth fruit, Minister Wilson? Well, the Bible covers that too in John 15, 4 through 5, it tells us. Ah, that's where we get the bringing forth the fruit. And abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. No more can ye, except ye abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. Uh, without me, you can do nothing. So the only way you can bring forth fruit, you got to stay attached to the vine. Who is the vine? Who is the? That's right. That's right. I've seen a lot of false fruit. I went over people's house, and it looked so real. I was about to bite on the apple, and then she said, oh, that's wax. I said, oh. Don't, don't be wax. Thank you, God. The only way you can keep your victory from the thief is by continuing in the word of God. Do you understand that Satan is afraid of the word of God? He's afraid of you knowing really what the word of God is. He's afraid of you really knowing who you are. He's afraid of that. Don't you remember what he did to Eve in the garden? He just changed the word a little bit. And that's what the devil does. He'll, he'll come riding up on you in that pretty fancy car that you like and, and wearing them Armani suits and, hey, how you doing? You know, I'm Reverend Dr. So-and-so. That's how he works. Don't get distracted just because he say he Reverend Dr. So-and-so. If he's not speaking what the word of God says, he's not the right Reverend Dr. So-and-so. Because you do know that the Satan, Satan knows the word of God. You do know that, right? Okay. He just don't want you to know it. And as you learn the word of God, which is the truth, it will make you free from anything in your life that does not look like God. The word of God will show you and let you see clearly what's in your life that does not look like God. If you stop looking at your neighbor's life, <laughs> and start looking at yourself was it michael jackson that said i'm talking to the man in the mirror you ought to start looking at the person in the mirror so we so busy trying to correct somebody over here when you need correcting work on you work on you one of my favorite sons is you need to sweep around your own doorstep before you try to sweep around mine Stop going to people with that judgmental attitude. Just go to them with love. 
James 1, 22 and 23. It tells, ah, there it go. But be ye doers of the word, uh-oh, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. What? You must be a doer of the word. What is it? You know, I hear a lot of people say, I'm doing the word. What do that mean? Being a doer of the word means obeying the word. You have to obey the word. And you have to do the work in order to keep the victory from the thief. And if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in the glass. You ever looked at your, how many of y'all looked in the mirror this morning? And many times you only remember what you looked like. You go back, I just went back, my hair was in place this morning. I went back, I was like, whoa, what happened? Because you forget just that quick. We must keep busy in the Lord and not be idle-minded. Idle mind is the devil's workshop. So you got to be busy doing something. There's so much to do to help build the kingdom of God. And you don't have to have minister, evangelist, prophetess, pastor. You don't need all them titles to work. Just work. Just work. I remember going over to Galatians and I told Pastor Cleveland, what you need me to do? You need somebody to clean the bathrooms. They're going to shine. They're going to shine. Just work. Do the work. What did the word of God tell us? Your gift will make room for you. You don't have to go in with all this. I'm Dr. Reverend so-and-so and just do the work. Ephesians 2 and 10. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Ah, whose workmanship are we? We were created in Christ Jesus to do what? Good works. So you got to keep busy doing things of the Lord. That's what we were created for. Galatians 5 and 16. Galatians 5 and 16 says, Then I say, this I say then, walk in the spirit and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Walking in the spirit. When you're walking in the spirit, it means you're keeping in step with the spirit. The spirit is not way back here and you're way up there. That's not walking in the spirit. It means keeping in step with the spirit. Hearing the spirit's voice, that small voice, that quiet voice. And then follow the voice and follow his lead and follow his directions. That's what walking in the spirit of God means. If you are a born again believer in Christ, you should no longer desire the things that used to have you bound. Your new desire should include doing things to build the kingdom of God. You should know without a doubt, I have victory. I have victory in spite of, in spite of what the doctor said. Oh, I got the doctor's report. But whose report am I going to believe? If God said I'm healed, I'm healed. In the name of Jesus, I have victory in spite of them laying me off on that job. Oh, God, I know you will take care of me because the word of God says that if you will take care of a bird, I know you will take care of me. I got victory in spite of, oh yes, I know my bills are due and I don't have no money to pay them. But in spite of all that, I'm still yet victorious. You ought to get to the place where God, I'll praise you. I'll praise you from the homeless shelter. And if they ain't got no room in the homeless shelter, I'll praise you out on the street, Father God, because I am victorious in you, 
because it was taking so long. They went about trying to do it themselves, Father God. They went about trying to fix it themselves, God. And so many times, Lord, you have made us a promise, God. And we try to fix it ourselves because, see, we think you are bound by time. Don't you know God holds time in his hands? Hallelujah. He's not bound by time. I know you're saying I'm getting older. God knows that. Don't give up the fight. Hallelujah. Don't stop standing. Hallelujah. That's your fight right there just to stand. Hallelujah. You are supposed to stand. You're supposed to stand on the word of God. You don't have to get in the way of God. Hallelujah. Whenever the enemy start whispering in your ear telling you, oh, you know how to make some money. You knew how to make some money before. Tell him, shut up. You're a liar. He is the father of lies. I'm standing on the promises of God. God will take care of me. He will see me through. See, God can't bless mess. We got to understand that. He won't bless mess. Hallelujah. So any mess you're in, come on out of it. Hallelujah. Be purged today. Be healed today. Be delivered today. In the name of Jesus. Tell the devil, you don't have a hold on me no more. I'm shaking myself loose from this. All in the name of Jesus. We are more than conquerors. <laughs> Through Christ Jesus, you're victorious. You're blessed. You've been set free. You're delivered. You don't have to put up with that anymore. The Lord has set you free today, whatever it is. Don't go back. Don't go back to it. Tell them I moved. I moved. I don't live here no more. And sometimes things in the natural will get worse before they get better in the natural. But in the spirit, he's working it out for you. All you got to do is believe and stand on his word. May God bless you and may God keep you and please, 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 please get to this word of God.